that's how actually I met you through the phone. You called one day when we first moved to Common Ground. And um, when we moved to this location, you, you were looking around for a place to come. Yeah. You know, you were excited that you finally found it. You were so excited. It was kind of fun to, to um, you know, hear your voice. It was like, oh, I read your website, you know, and I love your website. This yeah, this is the place I want to be. So, um, you know, you came, and um, I really didn't get to know you too well for a while, and you sat there. And what I, and I, what I, I found out about you later, that you were a licensed um, clinical psychologist, and you'd written a book. But here's what I was really, I wanted to say is that um, you've had 19 years experience of clinical training, or uh, an experience. Uh, you work in a private practice. Um, you've written for several online magazines. You recently had an interview with, was it E? Or? I was on Good Morning America yeah, recently. Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah. 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 And you work with people with eating disorders, low self-esteem, guilt, grief, trauma, death, everything. dying, everything you can imagine, everything. Um, and the successful moments. So you work with the whole yes. of a person. And here's what, why I wanted to talk to you. Not because you are an accomplished person, because you've written books. I wanted to talk to you because your heart is open and because you sat here, you came, you didn't bring your book and you didn't say, um, I'd like to do a class. I would like to um, sell my books here. I didn't even know you had a book. Um, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't know she was a psychologist. I didn't know anything um, until I got to know her and then I, this all came out. So it wasn't because you know, um, oh, Jerry's got the book out, and because she's been on Good Morning America that we want to interview. That wasn't it. I saw your heart as you sat here and didn't say a word for, what, nine months. <laughs> you sat quietly, and you, you kind of soaked in what Common Ground was all about. So that touches my heart, and I see that you have an open heart, and I just, I really want to get to know you. After I uh, got to know you a little bit, I read your book, and I really got to know you. Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> um, and um, it's so vulnerable. Your book is very vulnerable. I don't know if I could have written some of the stuff that you wrote about your childhood and how difficult a time, you know, that, that it was to get through it and then to um, come through it, such a loving soul, yeah. you know, as you are. So, um, I, I've talked a lot, and I, there is a piece I want to read, but um, I want you to say hello to everybody and maybe um, talk a little bit how you got to Common Ground and anything um, you'd like to say before we get started. Well, um... Uh, um, I came to Common Ground very broken, um, and I'm very shy, so um, I needed a place to go. My, my life really fell apart last year on my birthday, and um, I think I ended up here in June. Yeah. And so I came and cried every Sunday, <laughs> and um, a few people really reached out to me. I, um, that was really special for me. I knew mom here in the OC, so, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was my place where I could be quiet and private and broken, because I have 40 people in my private practice and a beautiful daughter that I have to be strong for every day. And London is your daughter, and she's here, yes. and she comes on Sundays. Hi, London. <laughs> so, L London's a lucky little girl to have a mama like you. So, so what I want to do is, um, let, let me just read a piece, a little okay. piece about what you wrote, and then I'd like you to comment kind of on it, on how you sure. feel about it. Sure. So you, she, what she did in this book is, your poetry is something that you kind of just rawly wrote at the time. Were you, that, were, did you write it as you were experiencing this, or late, way later? No, um, the poetry came first. I, I, saw, I saw this visually first, and I wrote the poetry in 12 days. Wow, okay. It was happening to me. Okay. I was not in charge of that. Okay, so that just came through you as you were yes. writing. Okay, so she writes this, uh, this these poems on it. I mean, it's too long to read, but it's about her ins instability, how unstable you were. Yeah. I'm thinking about that. Here's what you actually said about it. You said, at home, I tried to communicate the level of my fear and pain, but my feelings were dismissed, and in some form, in some form or another, I got the message that I was too sensitive. My peers made my life a living hell. This was deeply lonely and a scary experience. Both my age and older, they had the power to make me feel worthless on top of the worth worthlessness that I already brought to the table. I was ignored, left out, alienated, and given dirty looks. Notes were written about me in front of me. I was physically threatened by older girls. Things were written all over the bathroom about me. My coaches did nothing. My parents did nothing. The adults in my life did nothing. Um, and then you go on to say, and this is what I want to get to, my false self was growing. Um, if you repress your emotions, you keep them inside. You hide them by ingesting them. 
you internalize them, and then you become them. You were a pleaser, and you were compressed. You became a smaller version of who you know that you really are. How does that feel to um, hear the words that you wrote? Does it take you back? I never hear it out loud, so. Sherry, pull your mic up. Okay. Um, yeah, it's different hearing it. It makes it more real in, in many ways. So um, tell us your feelings at that time. Like. I was terrified um, at home, and I think that was easy for the kids at school to pick up on. I didn't write in there that I was an Olympic hopeful athlete, and so I got this attention for my sport, and that did not go well uh, in, in, in where I went to school. And so I was broken at home, and I was broken at school. And I went to school one day, and there was a note on my locker that said, I hate you, and 10 girls had signed it. Wow. And I had to, you know, be in the hallways with them. And I was terrified everywhere, and I couldn't go home and express myself. And so, to stay safe, I just would try to be what people wanted me to be, and I would chase them around and, and try to be nice to them, and just so that I could have a sense of peace. And so, so I'd be, I just shrunk. So you kind of were like a pleaser then that you became. You said that you oh, became this pleaser to completely. To, and it's been difficult to undo that because it's always been something that's made me safe. If I just do what people want me to do, then I don't rock the boat. And, and, and I uh, have been challenged to really live the meaning of this book starting last year. Wow. So that whole part of me has been able to stop. So tell us a little bit about, um, we don't have to get too deeply into it, but some of your childhood and, um, you know, you went through step-parents and um, oh, dads. Mm -hmm. and, um, well, both parents were married four times each. Um, and that was a bit of a marriage marathon. Um, and my dad was uh, physically and emotionally abusive, uh, continues to be. And uh, both parents are very narcissistic. So there wasn't a thought for me. And I was torn around in their lives where they wanted to go, who they wanted to be with, you know, things like birthdays that were supposed to be my day, a man would show up and it was really just a way to go on a date, you know, so I was a very s smart, uh, sensitive child, so I, I could read through the lines and, and maybe see things maybe other children wouldn't see, and then, you know, it, it just, I kept getting more repressed and more repressed, and at, one, at some point I was just really angry. And so that, that anger came out uh, in the appropriate teenage years, but I was really angry and very, very sad. So um, along the way, when did you decide, how did you know that you had to deal with this? You know, and that, that or did it just come naturally? What, you know, how was it that all of a sudden you changed? Well, I, um, I had an eating disorder. Okay, so well, I, talk about that a little bit, that's important. I had, uh, figured out a way with food to make my life good or bad and, and instead of basing it on my behavior or judgments of others of me uh, I was the, the bad kid because I spoke up and so um, I didn't like being bad anymore and so I, I just stopped eating and food was good food or it was bad food and so I could control my goodness or my badness through what I ate okay. or didn't eat so if I ate good food I was a good girl and if I ate bad food, then I was a bad girl. And I ended up in this world of, and really beautifully, of I had some control finally. Um, I'm too scared to throw up, so I never went there. But I uh, was able to find a balance, believe it or not. The, the anorexia was a real gift for me uh, because I found some sort of ground where I could decide if I was good or bad. But it isolated me into a world, and I would really, I would go to school and I'd watch my peers eat, and I would be like, I'm so much stronger than they are, because I don't eat. And they have nothing on me now. And then, with a narcissistic family, the thinner I got, it was like, oh, you're so pretty. And so, it ended up rewarding me in a very sick way. Wow. So when did you, you come to terms with that? When did you realize well, that got that's caught. not the way to live? I got caught. I was undressing in the girls' locker room, and I had six pairs of long underwear on under my jeans. Wow. And um, the gym teacher was in there early, and I didn't know she was there. And so they called home and said, you know, we think she's pretty sick. 
Now, did they know at the time that your parents, did, they didn't have, you hid all this from, from them? I hid all this. I, I grew up under a brother who was a superstar, uh, played pro football for five years, and we grew up in a small town, and so, you know, he was very visible, I was invisible, he was the good kid, I was the bad kid, and so, um, you know, for me, once I got exposed, it was just like, oh, Sherry, here she goes again, now she's got an eating disorder. I was a real drag well, for them. So how did you end up? Um, I ended up in therapy. You went to therapy, and that was kind of the beginning? <coughs> that was the beginning. That was the so beginning. no wonder you're a therapist now. Yeah. Huh? So, so, <laughs> so along the way, there were people. And I, I, I want to mention that because I think that's important that when we go through these things, that there's other people there. If we, you yeah. know, Did they just appear out of your life? Did you look for them? They um, appeared. They appeared at times that if they didn't appear, it would have maybe been a scary path for me. Um, I had three people. My therapist was one, and then a woman came in my bed with me one night, and she took care of me when my dad was downstairs drunk and on drugs. And um, and then... Uh, a just held you, so that held because me. you were so scared. I was crying, yeah. and she said, Jesus Christ, isn't anyone going to go up and take care of that little girl? Wow. And she got in bed with me, and she had long blonde hair, and she was crying and telling me how her dad had died, and she knew how I felt, and she was wiping my tears and rubbing my face, and she did more parenting for me in that hour than my parents did in an entire childhood. Wow. So, um, when I hear you speak of your mom and your dad and some of the things you know that you went through, um, the one thing I get is that there, the communication, there was no listening, right? There, a lot of it, besides the abuse and things like that, there was no openness for you to share the pain that you were feeling because you, you had been shoved everywhere, different places, they were gone, there was no stability, and you really didn't have any close people at all in your life. I, and I'm still not close with them. Yeah. I mean, their reaction to this book was inhumane. Well, yeah. So. Because yeah. it, yeah, it, it grabbed at their, their ego, I'm sure, you know. To, but as you have come through this, mm -hmm. you've been able to be in communication with your mom. And with my mom. Yeah, yeah we, have, we have communication. Um, I know who she is. In my book, I set up a system of boundaries around a house, and I have a porch, a yard, and a fence. And my mom's at the fence. And I don't love her any less than someone in my porch, but she doesn't, she makes a mess on my porch or on my in my yard so <laughs> and uh, when she's made the mess uh, maybe like many I'll say gosh you just made a huge mess in my yard and what I get from her is well it's your yard and so it, it's taken me a lot of years to get her where she is but m my father and my brother I have chosen to terminate relationships with them over the way that they handle uh, this how, wh what, how do you do your relationship different with London than um, your parents did. How did you end up being the mom that you are after the parenting? London has been uh, an amazing corrective experience for me. I've been able to give to her what that woman gave to me that one night every day. And she knows that she's the center of my world. So, yeah. How did you know that you were lovable? How did you finally come to terms that you were lovable? What gave you the um, or are you? Do you feel lovable all the time, or not? Is this still um, a process that you're in? I do now feel lovable all the time. Um, I know who I am. Mm -hmm. I've worked very, very hard. Uh, my therapist was instrumental, and um, life experience. Uh, when I've been brought to my knees, I seem to find myself there. So somehow, when I'm at the lowest low, that's where I find myself. Isn't that something, how we have to do that? You know, I can relate to that. It's like when, yeah. when you really um, are on your knees, it's almost like at your deepest low, I think that's the time that we have the openings, you know, in our hearts that, that spirit can work through us. Somehow they bring the people to you oh, that you need. The right book, the right person, the right insight. And um, I've been down hard, hard, hard many times. Um, and the reaction to my book was the start of a pretty painful time. So I found myself again, you know, but those layers are, are good. I, I believe I'm very resilient, though, and I sometimes think that's genetic, but I'm very resilient. I'm a competitor, and um, 
I've had significant people stay consistent with me in my life and they have helped to mirror that to me. But loving yourself is a journey. I really think you travel alone. Mm -hmm. um, and I've learned that no, no matter how many people support you through your emotions, they're still yours yeah. and no one can fix them for you. Um, I have paper parents. I've always sought out books if I've wanted calm, rational, sound advice, and, and I've sought that since I was little. I mean, I was failing fifth grade, but I read every little house on the prairie book pretending I had a family. So, <laughs> um, I still turn to books. They parent me. and The books that me. you listed in here, too, are the books that we teach from. They're, it's awesome because it's every book. I went, oh, I love this one. I love that one. You know, so I, I totally can relate to that. You know, that books got you through uh, they did. the time. And they you know. were my parenting. Um, you know, there were good things about my family, too. It's not a black and white mm -hmm. issue. And I, I try to be very clear about that in my book because my parents were snuggly. And, you know, my dad was really funny. And, um, you know, my mom has her really great traits. And so, I, you know, the pint and the gallon what we talked about yeah, in church yeah. a, a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, you know. They might be teaspoons <laughs> and I'm a gallon, but I know what they are and I have had to adjust my expectations and so that's why they're at the fence. You know, I think my dad and brother are probably in the picket line out there, <laughs> but um, that's okay. That's their energy, not mine. Yeah. Well, I got that you deeply loved your dad and you were very, you know, um, when he left, that it was very painful. That yeah. was one of the most, um, you know, painful things. It was very, very painful. So if someone came to you um, and told you about their life, which was your life, how, how would, what would you say to them if they're going through a real difficult time? Where do they start? You know? they, they, they start by getting up and suiting up. I mean, sometimes all I could do was just get up and make it through the day, but I chose to see that as a success. It's really how you think. If you go, oh, barely making it through the day, you know, then you're going to barely make it through the day. And for me, I was like, oh, I made it through the day. <laughs> You know, so it's a moment by moment process. Moment you know? by moment. Sometimes it was just really step by step for me. I would make agreements. I am not going to cry from seven until nine, and then when nine o'clock comes and I need to cry, then I'll cry it out. But then I got to get back up. I was so alone, and in some ways maybe that was a gift because I, I was all, I could count. I was never went to church. I was never brought up that way, um, and I would pray at night. I would pray that God would just take me. And then when I would wake up in the morning, I would not believe in God. Because I thought, who, who would put a child through these feelings every day? I, I watched the, the, I told you I wanted to do the Pink video. There was a video but by an artist named Pink, and it reminded me of your story. You know, have you ever seen that video? No. Oh, it, it's, yeah, and it shows the little girl going to school, and, you know, the kids are mean to her, and they write about her, and she's had this, you know, tough parent. It was really good. I mean, she, it, and, and I thought about you at the time of going through that and how you came through not being bitter because you mm -hmm. can, you know, go either way, right? You know, you can get bitter or better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, uh, you got better. I got better and I'm still getting better. You yeah. Know? And that's important to say, I think that we I'm can't say that this is, this is a process, yeah. right? So you're still going to have painful days. You're still going to have days when you just want to, you know, punch them, and then days that you start to, you know, open up and feel the love. Yeah, I, I attracted um, higher level people in my life, too. I went through eight months of just really coming out of a cocoon and, and, and flourishing into, into something new, and so the, the new loves in my life are, are offering me a love I've never had or felt, and, and I can be very awkward and shy and you know, at this point, I'm feeling really loved and accepted, and, and that's a new, very new experience for me. So sometimes I get really scared, and I am very shy. You know, I come here, and I, I split. <laughs> I am shy, and I, I don't talk about myself. Yeah, you, you don't stand for, for hospitality, no. do you? I, you know. <laughs> Stay the day. You know. So um, we, um, yeah, I, I came, and I'm not one to talk much about myself and my you know my book is out and I have 45,000 Facebook fans and you know I'll talk to them but they're strangers <laughs> like, it's, it's easier sometimes I think to be able to talk to a crowd of people than a one-on-one yeah. -on -one because you have to really open uh, open up and mm -hmm. and you did it in your book I did I mean wow. you know so many poetry is you know really um, it's out very there exposing and, yeah this book is and and I, I sat on it for for two years I mean it took seven years to write this book 
When did you start writing this? Stuff? I started it writing it, oh uh, gosh, it was right before I got pregnant with London. The poetry was done, and then it was just poetry, and I didn't know what to do with it. And I knew something profound had happened, but I, I didn't know what to do with it because I didn't want to hurt anybody. So, okay, I, I think people can get that too because sometimes, you know, you, you have that energy and you just need to release it. And sometimes people throw it away. Oh, I was they, having to pull the car over, get out of the shower. I mean, it was... The, what, the energy of the poems the were coming? Yeah, I'd never written a poem in my life. I'm not a poet. I mean, I'm hardly a can draw a stick figure. And this just, <laughs> just came, and it came in a way that maybe... Uh, coming out like a song made it a little bit more gentle for my psyche to hear it but I when I hear it out loud when you read it to me yeah it makes me very emotional Do when you feel like you're there almost um, yeah back again when you hear yeah. the words yeah I so do. do you go back and read your poetry ever again or do you not want to be there um, I have reread it. In fact, uh, last year when, when my life fell apart, I, um, I consulted my own book to help me. And then I was like, God, I can't believe I wrote this. <laughs> I can't believe so you get people on your, your book, right? You, you, she takes them through the journey, yeah. right? Uh, it's an interesting way that you've written the book. Yeah. And um, so if someone comes to you and they use your book, right, then it's like they go through this journey, a boat ride. Yes. You know, kind of tell them about that boat ride and the, I, the I, I, metaphors. I, I saw a boat in, in my mind, and I saw ice and caverns, and it was black and gray and dark, and I was in that boat. And it was almost like Ebenezer Scrooge where I was traveling through all these memories where the most maimed there's, there's much that's not written about. My dad was in cults and other things, so I didn't want to make it too colorful. <laughs> but the most maimed parts of me, him being in a cult didn't maim me, but him physically abusing me did. Okay. So I would go almost like I had an adult self and a child self, and I was the adult in the boat watching the child getting abused, and I was saving her. And so the, the, the book is, is going through the, the um, I don't know, passages, I guess. And then you offer the reader to get out and feel it, yeah. what they're going through. And that's how, how you kind of take them through. Yeah, I have several patients that are reading the book right now. When a patient of mine reads my book, um, it's so self-sharing. Thank God I'm humanistic, and I use that as a tool. But um, it has definitely deepened my relationships with my parents, my patients, because I think they, sometimes when people see me, they think I'm they, that I don't hurt or I'm yeah. not smart or... <laughs> you know, whatever, and so they they just brings me much closer, and they seem to go deeper into themselves when, when they read the book. Elizabeth Vargas from 2020 just asked for the book, so Yay. she just got out of rehab for alcoholism, so we'll see if she uses it, so we'll cross our fingers. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Wow. So, um, we're just about out of time, but let me um, uh, ask you on, um, if you were to tell somebody how to love themselves if they don't feel lovable. Because I'll tell you, when Judy and I do counseling, mm -hmm. one of the major um, questions or things that we get is that people don't feel lovable. They just don't feel lovable. What would you say to them? I think you have to start with how you think about yourself. And, and you know, the brain works in grooves and we go over those same negative thoughts over and over. You've got to jump out of that track and learn to make a new one. And um, read, work hard and you have to think of yourself differently. Your actions will follow your thoughts. But you have to love yourself. I put loving instead mm -hmm. of love because loving is an action. It's a verb. And I take care of myself physically every day. I eat correctly. I exercise. And if your physical body isn't well, you're not going to be well emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And I learned that uh, being anorexic. It took yeah. my body seven years wow. to get well. I have really destroyed uh, my, my body chemistry. Wow. Um, a, a, it's amazing if, if you eat correctly and you exercise that your brain has what it needs um, to function. We don't test segments on the brain, we digest them. They're tested on your digestion. Mm -hmm. So what you eat is what you feel, and um, that's a huge part of loving yourself. And then you have to know that no one can stop you but you. I like that. And, and, and you have to not let stopping yourself be an option. For me to survive, I was either going to kill myself 
or I was going to get up and suit up. And being an athlete um, and a prodigy athlete on top of that, um, I think I, I had that natural training to get up and, and suit up even when I was being physically abused or emotionally abused or neglected, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. I did go into my own little world. We all have our own little world, all of us. And you have to love yourself and you're not so perfect moments. You know, um, last month we talked about forgiveness all month. Yeah. And, um, and forgiveness isn't necessarily, you know, rec reconciling with the person or even greeting them, but it's being able to let go inside. Do you feel like you have done that with them? Um, the people in your life. I, I do. I, I, I now know that rec uh, forgiveness doesn't mean reconciliation. With my brother and father, I, I can have that love for them as they're other human beings on the planet if they're not in my yard or on my porch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that makes sense. I totally, I totally get that. <laughs> or, or near my fence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to, the closing paragraph, I want to read because I, when we close, I think you wrote something that was, I think, important. Um, and there we go. Um, you said you are here to have the complete experience of life. Um, you want to experience all of its angles, edges, and crevices. You will rip and tear. You will cry and you'll be in crisis. You will bleed and fail. You will give it all of your blood and sweat and tears and still fail. Then you will succeed beyond your wildest dreams. Soar to new and more significant heights. Laugh with all your might. Love deeply and wildly. And experience times of complete harmony. Life is designed this way. It is supposed to be this way. If it weren't this way, you could not evolve. You develop your singularity through this process and you alchemize all of your bricks to crystal. You build yourself into a whole through having a whole life experience. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. You go through the pains. That's what we say here all the time. You go through the pain. You go through the joys. 10,000, the Buddha say 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrows. It looks like you've all experienced them in the short time you've been here. Yeah. You know, two words uh, kind of, words are sort of interesting to me, but resent pulled itself apart. And I learned young that if I resent people, and, and you take that word apart, it would get re-sent back to me. So I learned that resenting was not going to get me anywhere forward because that energy would just stay in me. It doesn't matter how much I resent somebody. It doesn't change what happened. So there's no delete button for the abuse and the other things I went through and the more I sat in it, it was just getting reset back to me. And then remember pulled itself apart visually for me and as I remembered my childhood, I was remembering myself, putting myself back together. Love that. You know, wow. um, I had to get down in that cellar, it was one of the, the pieces of the book and I was remembering so that I could remember myself, put myself back together, all everything that had been broken. And those two words ended up being very profound for me. I uh, use them often in, in my practice with my patients and um, they, they seem to be powerful, but they would just pull apart in my head and I would be like, wow, all my members had fallen. All my pieces were broken, so I had to remember, glue myself back together. And we're, we're all capable of doing it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the last uh, question I'll have for you is uh, if you, you wanted everybody to know one thing about you, mm -hmm. because that's what uh, you are, you, you are a, a member of Common Ground now. Yes. And you come and um, people don't know you, a lot of them. What would you like them to know about you? Um, that I'm just a really sweet person. I love it. You are a sweet person. And I'm Thank very you. shy. <laughs>